welcome to my channel. This video will be the first part of a series of two videos on neonatal maladjustment syndrome in foals. In this part I'm going to speak about the pathogenesis while the second part will focus on the treatment. Ok, first of all there are many terms that are used to describe this disease in foals. Neonatal maladjustment syndrome, neonatal encephalopathy and dummy fall syndrome are considered acceptable terms because they are based on clinical signs and do not assume any specific pathophysiologic process. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and perinatal asphyxia syndrome may be valid when perinatal ischemia or hypoxia is recognized but may not apply to falls born uneventfully or that develop signs hours to days later. This is also supported by the lack of post-mortem cerebral lesions consistent with ischemia in several of these falls. Clinical signs are characterized by reduced awareness of the environment, failure to find the other and sac, lack of affinity for the mare, wandering and in more severe cases alterations in the process of thermoregulations, reduced gut motility and seizures. The failure to find the HAD can lead to failure of passive transfer of immunity. The estimated incidence is 1-2%. There are two clinical presentations. The first category includes falls that are normal immediately after delivery, pregnancy was uneventful and they start developing clinical signs 6-24 hours after birth. They usually have a good prognosis. In the second category are included falls that are born from a dystocia or after a placental disease and they show abnormal behavior since birth. Septicemia is usually a concurrent problem and they have a worse prognosis. For decades, there has been a tendency to group falls with neurological signs in the immediate postpartum period under a single umbrella, while it is possible that different pathophysiological mechanisms are involved. In falls that born normally and develop signs hours to days later, it is possible that delayed effects from hypoxia are involved, but it is also possible that metabolic and endocrine imbalances play a more central role in these cases. So the pathogenesis can be separated into ischemic hypoxic and non-ischemic events. In falls in which adverse peripartum events are documented, all organs with high oxygen demand and metabolic activity may be affected. On the contrary, in falls in which pregnancy and parturition were uneventful, it is probable that mechanisms unrelated to oxygen and energy delivery are involved. In these falls, metabolic, endocrine and neurotransmitter imbalances may be implicated. Ok, let's start considering the ischemic hypoxic events. Well, there are several factors that can lead to hypoxia in fetus or newborn falls. And as you can see from this table, they can be grouped into maternal, placental or fetal factors. Now, the lack of oxygen to the brain will cause an ischemic injury, which can be divided into three stages. So the first phase is what happens immediately after the ischemic event. Cells are deprived of oxygen and energy to use the anaerobic metabolism leads to production of lactate, free radicals and cytokines. Neurons get swollen and there is dysfunction of the sodium-potassium ATP pump. All these events can culminate with neuronal death. The second phase starts from 6 hours after the ischemia and may last for several days. The massive release of glutamate continues to cause electrolyte imbalances and there is continuous influx of calcium in the cells that leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. The production of cytokines and free radicals continue also during this phase and cells may undergo to apoptosis. The third phase 
is well described in humans, but not very studied in animals. It is characterized by an ongoing inflammation and remodeling of the cells, delayed cell death, and altered cell proliferation. Regarding non-ischemic events, the theory is that there is a failure of the transition from fetal to neonatal life. There can be an excess of neurosteroids in the brain, delayed reduction of progestogens, and dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This theory is supported by the fact that the syndrome seems to occur more frequently in falls born from cesalear section or that experience very rapid births. Both neurons and glial cells have the enzymatic possibility to produce neurosteroids from cholesterol in response to energy or oxygen deprivation. These steroids suppress brain activity and maintain the fetus in a sleep-like state, while neurons and glial cells develop and differentiate. By suppressing the excitability, the fetal brain is also protected from a hypoxic ischemic injury. So actually, the two mechanisms of ischemic and non-ischemic events are not completely separate, but possibly they can both play a role. But the theory of non-ischemic events as the main cause of this syndrome is supported by the way these falls recover, as if hypoxia was the principal responsible of clinical signs, then the recovery would be expected to be slow and to leave some kind of neurological deficits. While these falls usually recover quickly, which is more compatible with the decline of pregnant mediated sedative effects. Let's see now the transition process. In utero, the fall is maintained in a sleep-like status by the progestogens produced by the placenta and by the endogenous neurosteroids. Also, the soft cushioned sensation of the uterus contributes to the somnolence of the fetus. When the delivery is near, the placenta switches the production of progestogens to estradiol, that is a potent neuroactivator. But when passing through the birth canal, the fall is squeezed on the thorax, and this compression causes a reflex of inhibition of movement, somnolence and immobility. When the pressure is released, the cold and hard surfaces of the external environment cause activation of the locus ceruleus with production of norepinephrine that ultimately leads to arousal and consciousness. Complications of neonatal maladjustment syndrome include gastrointestinal problems such as reflux or diarrhea, also acute renal failure. Many falls also suffer of failure of passive transfer of immunity as they do not assume enough colostrum or there is decreased absorption of immunoglobulins from the gastrointestinal tract. Tuse sepsis is another common problem. There is no specific test for the diagnosis of neonatal maladjustment syndrome, so it is usually reached by exclusion of other differentials, which I resumed in this table, but probably the most common, and that can be also a concurrent problem, is the septicemia. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Next time I will speak about treatment and prognosis. So press like, comment if you have any question and subscribe to the channel to get a notification when I upload new videos. Bye!